Well, hello everybody in Wilhelmina, Oregon. My name is Bo, and I am coming to you from the Earth and Space Science Center. We are located in Tyler, Texas, and I am going to be your host for today's virtual field trip to the planetarium. And I want to say a special thank you to the Wilhelmina Public Library, as well as the South Yamhill River Astronomy Club for organizing this field trip for you today. Now, in today's virtual planetarium field trip, uh, we are going to be taking a look at the stars in the sky, talking about the constellations, uh, and doing a lot of fun explorations of what we can see in the sky at night. Now, if you've never been to a planetarium before, let me tell you a little bit about them. They are really, really neat places. Uh, they're kind of like a movie theater, but I, th I think they're way better. Um, so instead of the screen being in front of you in a flat screen, in the planetarium, the screen is above you. It's kind of this domed or curved theater. And you can look all around you, a 360 degree experience. It's really, really neat. Um, and once things start opening back up and it's safe to do so, um, I really encourage everybody to visit their local planetarium. And I know near you, I think the closest ones, there's one in Portland and there's also one in Eugene. Um, again, whenever they're open and you're able to visit, I absolutely encourage you uh, to do so. So um, with that though, we're going to travel to our virtual planetarium and I'll show you what that looks like. So here we go. All right, now again, a planetarium and normally is going to have a domed or curved screen to it. And you'll be able to look all around you and see um, the sky up above. That's what we're able to kind of simulate here in our virtual planetarium, but we have to shrink it down into what we call our window to the sky. Now I can look all around, I can look up to the sky up above, I can also look all around the horizon, and these letters that you see on the screen, they of course represent the directions that we're facing, so that S is south, W of course is west, N is north, and E will of course be east. Now, one thing I didn't mention yet is that my planetarium is a time machine, which means I can make time move faster or slower, and we can see the position of the objects in the sky and how they change over the course of a day. So I'm going to start speeding up time. I want you to make an observation about what you see happening in the sky. You can of course see our sun right over there. It's still early in the morning, so it appears to be over in the eastern part of the sky. But now as time is speeding up, notice how it looks like the sun appears to be moving up higher in the sky. Now that it's up there, kind of at its highest point, or about midday here. And eventually it will appear as if it is moving down towards the western part of the sky. You may have heard, of course, that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. The first thing I want to talk about before we go much further is why that happens. What is causing the sun to move across the sky? Now... <clears throat> You, for a long time, people thought that actually the sun was moving, that it, the sun revolved or moved around the earth. Um, and that's what caused it to look like it's moving across the sky. And from a certain point of view, that kind of makes sense because um, it, yeah, it looks like it's moving. It started off over in eastern part of the sky over here in the morning. And then it moved over to the west. It wasn't in the same spot. And that confused people for a really long time. And so the, their original explanation was that, yeah, the earth was the center of everything and everything in the sky revolves around earth. And it took some uh, interesting thinking and some thinking outside the box to maybe understand that something else is happening here. 
And actually, it's not the sun that's moving, but it's us. It's the earth. Even though we can't really feel ourselves moving, it's the earth that is doing the moving. And we can model this or test this out really simply, um, uh, just wherever you are. So if you take your thumb and you stick it out nice and straight in front of you, hold your arm nice and straight out in front of you, give yourself a big thumbs up. And we're going to pretend that your thumb is the sun. Okay? And we're going to pretend that your head or your face is the earth. Now, keeping your thumb nice and still in front of you, I want you to turn and look slowly to the left. So as you do, now your thumb ends up on the right side of your face. Before, when you were just looking at it, it was right in front of you. But as you turn your head, now your thumb is on the side of your face. Okay. And if you did that correctly, your thumb didn't actually move at all. And that's a similar thing to what's happening in the sky, is that the earth is turning. And the earth is turning, or we like to say rotating, towards the east. And as it does, it looks like objects move to the west. And I know that sounds kind of backwards or confusing that the earth is rotating to the east and so things look like they're moving to the west. But the way that you can help remember that is just your thumb and your face. So as you turn your head to the left, your thumb ends up on the right side of your face. So for things to look like they're moving to the west, earth is actually rotating in the opposite direction. It's rotating towards the east. Okay. Now this is, of course, what also gives us our day and night cycle. So when the sun is in the sky, when we're on the side of Earth that's facing the sun, of course it's daytime. Just like we'll say, when I'm facing you, it's like I'm facing the sun, so it would be daytime for me. But as the Earth rotates, eventually you're facing away from the sun. And now it would be nighttime. But for anybody living on the back side of my head, and now it would be daytime for them. You continue rotating. Now it's daytime for me. Nighttime. Daytime. And I'm going to stop before I make myself too much dizzier there. Uh, I've also got another little styrofoam ball to model the Earth here. But yeah, the Earth is rotating on what we call its axis, which is this imaginary line that goes through the center uh, from the North Pole to the South Pole. Earth rotates on its axis, so it takes 24 hours for the Earth to make one full rotation. Of course, that's one day. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and continue rotating the Earth. As we do, we'll get to, to sunset and tonight just right after sunset you may be able to see a tiny sliver of the crescent moon it'll be kind of tough to see before it falls below the horizons but maybe you can get a peek at the moon tonight and then it starts getting a little bit darker you may be able to see lots and lots of bright objects in the sky. Now, the further away that you get from a city, the more stars that you'll be able to see in the sky. And that's because of something called light pollution. Let me see here if I can change it. So, what a lot of people will normally see is stars like this that uh, be able to see some of the brighter stars but once you start moving away from um, kind of the bright city lines you're able to see a lot more stars in fact there are countless numbers of stars in the sky and so we're going to talk about some of the constellations that we can see and I know there are some questions as well I want to be sure to answer some of the questions that you've sent in so to start off I like to uh, face the northern part of the sky. You might be able to see 
Definitely one of the more well-known constellations, and it might help if I turn on that light pollution, kind of limit some of the stars. You might be able to see that constellation a little bit clearer. And if we look kind of above north, you might see a group of seven stars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, does anybody know what constellation this might be? Yeah, this is the constellation sometimes referred to as the Big Dipper. I'm going to turn on the lines of this constellation. Showing you that there's actually more to it than just the Dipper. In fact, it extends out this way. And down here, and down here, I'm going to turn off those lines again, maybe give you, see a little better. Okay, so this group of stars right here, they belong to the constellation known as Ursa Major. And I know it looks kind of upside down, just that's how it is in the sky right now. But yeah, this is the constellation of Ursa Major. And what do you think this looks like to you? Now, with constellations, the, the neat thing is that people use their imaginations and they saw all sorts of different pictures and different things in the sky. And so, um, some people, they thought that this might look like a bear. Ursa Major means the big bear. And it's kind of funny because we don't often think of bears as having those long tails, right? But uh, in the kind of the stories and mythology that they told with these constellations. The Ursa Major was a bear with a long tail. Now Ursa Major is a very important constellation. One, because it's very easy to see, but two, because it's also a guiding constellation. And so, if I turn off the kind of the picture here, and and we look at just the, kind of the ends of the dipper, or kind of in the middle of the Ursa Major, these two stars right here, they are pointer stars. They're going to help us find another, constel another constellation and also another star. So we follow these down into a straight line and take us to uh, this star right here. And this star just so happens to be the tail end of the Little Dipper. Okay. Now the Little Dipper is, is kind of harder to see than the Big Dipper because the stars are not quite as bright and so usually when people see the Little Dipper the stars that they're gonna see are this one right here and then these two at the end and they kind of curve around and this makes up the big and Little Dipper now this star right here that's at the tail of the Little Dipper the one that we use the Big Dipper to point to this is a very important star, and you may be able, maybe you've already guessed what star it is. Kind of looking what it's above. Yeah, it is above my N, which of course is north. So this is the North Star, also known as Polaris. Now Polaris is a very important star. It is the guiding star in the night sky. And I'm going to show you why that is here. I'm going to speed up time again. As I do, watch that star. Notice how as the Earth is continuing to rotate, we see all the other stars that appear to move around it. But the North Star stays in the same spot in the sky. So it does not actually uh, appear to move. That's because <clears throat> Earth's North Pole 
is pointed pretty much at the North Star. So as the Earth rotates, it will appear to stay in the same part of the sky, while all the other stars appear to move around it. Okay. So this was very useful for people a long, long time ago as they were trying to navigate and they didn't have things like GPS or, um, you know, the internet or devices to really tell them where to go, they would use markers that they saw in the sky, like the North Star. All right. So, I think we've stayed up pretty much the entire night, but you notice that the North Star is still there. We just can't really see it. In fact, all of the stars are still in the sky, but the only reason we can't see them is because our sun is so much bigger and brighter, and it illuminates our atmosphere, giving us a nice blue sky during the daytime. Now, as the sun again does its daily motion, I'm moving from the east to the west. I'm going to go ahead and turn us and face the south part of the sky. <clears throat> and maybe we can see some other constellations on a different part of the sky. All right. Now, there are a lot of different constellations. In fact, I think one of the questions from Michelle was asking how many constellations are there? I'm going to take a look at some that we can see, um, but there are many, many constellations. In fact, um, depending on what constellation uh, culture you're talking about, that answer can differ. So when we talk about um, kind of the traditional constellations that we think of, in fact, there are 88 different constellations. And let's see, tonight there are many that we can see. So just after sunset, if you look to the southern part of the sky, you're going to see something it almost kind of look like a backwards question mark or maybe kind of a hook in the sky. Let's see here. Lines. Kind of looks like that backwards question mark. Then there's also extends out this way. This is one of the the spring summer constellations. It's it's one that I really like to see. And this is the constellation known as Leo. Again, I apologize if that name is upside down. But yeah, this is the constellation of Leo. And what do you see? What kind of constellation do you think this looks like? Using our imaginations, this might be a lion, perhaps? Yeah. Now, with Leo, if you kind of look towards the west or kind of follow Leo off to the right, you're going to see two stars that look fairly identical. Almost kind of like twins. All right, and these are the Gemini twins right here. So we have the Gemini twins. And then if we look on to the other side of Leo, you might see another group of bright stars over here. And this makes up the constellation known as Virgo. And these constellations may sound familiar to some of you. These constellations make up what's been referred to as the zodiac. Now the zodiac um, 
is really just a group of constellations that kind of all fall within this general line right here known as the ecliptic um, and it's kind of a it's the line that it appears as if the sun the moon and the star or the sun the moon and the planets all travel along and so uh, constellations on within this that kind of uh, were constellations that people took note of now the there was a question from sam as to why do we have constellations and there's lots of different reasons why we have constellations one of them has to do with uh, just people wanting to tell stories and share their culture um, and pass down information and so believe it or not a long time ago thousands and thousands of years ago they didn't have things like the internet they didn't have um, you know, ways to binge their favorite shows they couldn't see movies there weren't TV shows even books were kind of hard to come by so they told stories and shared knowledge and information uh, using the stars and so there were lots of different reasons and why they did this but another thing another reason they they use the constellations was because they don't stay the same year round in fact there are different constellations that we can see at different times of the year and I'm going to jump ahead 30 days so we're gonna move a month into the future I want you to watch and see how these constellations Gemini Leo Virgo how they change and they look different a month from now. So, one, two, three. Notice how now Gemini, you can barely see Gemini, but we can still see Leo and Virgo. And now we're starting to see another constellation. And we're starting to see. Scorpius, but we won't really be able to see Scorpius until we go another 30 days into the future. So now we're in July, and the constellations of Leo and Virgo, they're further off to the west, and now there's other constellations that are starting to show up in the evening sky. It's kind of an interesting thing to think about that the constellations change and look different uh, depending on what season it is. Now to get a better understanding and idea of why this happens, I actually want to do something else. I want to turn my planetarium into a spaceship. So if you're ready, we're going to blast off from Earth and travel into space. Alright, so are you ready? Any good spaceship blast off needs a countdown, right? From 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Blast off. Here we go. Alright, now we are traveling above the planet Earth. So, while we're here, I want to just again illustrate this concept of rotation. Is that the Earth is spinning, so as we speed up time, we can see the Earth rotating. And we have two sides. We, of course, have the daytime and the nighttime side of Earth. Now, there are constellations around us all the time. There are some that are up in the sky during the day, where the sun is up in front of them. Those constellations we can't see. We can only see constellations and other stars when we are on the nighttime side of Earth. Okay, so there are constellations all around us, but we can only ever see the constellations on the nighttime side of the sky. But at different points of the year, we'll actually be able to see constellations differently. Because while the Earth is rotating, spinning around on its axis, it's also making another path. 
That purple line is the path that the moon makes around the Earth. And then this blue line is the path that the Earth makes around the sun. Okay. Now, to help illustrate and help you understand, whenever we are on this side of the sun, everything that's on this side with us is on the nighttime side. And then everything on this side of the sun would be the daytime side. Okay. So these constellations over here, we can't see because they're in the daytime sky. We can only see the constellations that are over here on this side when we're on this side of the sun. But the Earth revolves around the sun. It makes this circular path. Of course, it takes 365 days to do that one year and now once we are on this side of the sun those constellations that we couldn't see before they're now on the nighttime side and then the constellations over here these are now on the daytime side and we can't see them during the day because again the sun is so bright Okay, it blocks out the light from the stars in the daytime sky. So, these constellations are <clears throat> referred to as the zodiac constellations. And the reason they're important and why people um, passed down this information was because they helped uh, people know what season it was going to be. Uh, of course, we can tell what season's going to be from a couple different ways. In the summer, it's hotter. In the winter, it's colder, right? But you can also tell what season it is by what stars are up in the sky. And so um, that was important for a lot of people, especially um, farmers who needed to understand when to plant certain crops and when to harvest crops. Um, they would know what season it was by the stars in the sky, what constellations they could see. So that's one of the reasons why we have constellations. Um, but another reason is because they can serve as a map or a guide to understanding and tracking objects, other objects in space. So I'm going to do something really quick here. I'm going to return us back to Earth back to kind of our view of the sky we can see what things look like for us here on earth now bear with me because we're going to get really close and then it will appear as if we're going to pop back over here to earth three two one there we go all right so here we are again landed safely and returned to Earth. And let's go ahead and bring us to our nighttime sky again. So continue to rotate the Earth. Do, do, do. And show that there are lots of constellations. In fact, there are a total of 88 constellations in the sky. We talked about why we can't see all of them at any one time, but there are 88 different constellations. And in addition to telling us the seasons, they can also serve as a map to the sky. So there was a question um, from Rebecca. Are all stars part of one constellation or another? And then what are the criteria for a group of stars to be called a constellation? So the first part, are all stars part of one constellation or another? So there's two answers for that. The first is no, but also yes. So when we think of a constellation, if you're thinking of the picture, the lines that they make, they are uh, made of certain stars and usually the brightest stars in the sky. Um, kind of the brightest stars and people use their imaginations to make a picture with those. However, 
in another sense, all stars are part of a constellation because if you look, say, here in Virgo, anything that's within this box, any star or any object um, that is in this area, we would say is part of the constellation of Virgo. And so these constellations, they make up a, a map of the entire sky. And so if we wanted to see what was in the constellation of Leo, anything within this box we would say is in the constellation of Leo. But when we're talking about the picture, that actually has a different name. It's called an asterism. It's a picture that we make with the stars. So, uh, in one sense, no, not every star is part of a constellation. And usually, the stars that make up the picture are the brighter stars in the region. But in another sense, yes, every star is part of a constellation because it, every star will fall somewhere within that map, within that boundary. All right. Now, there's another question here um, from Jim and it had to do with stars' names. And also Grace was asking about star names. And do all the stars have names? And... Again, that's a, a yes and a no question. So some of the stars have actual formal names, and these are some of the brighter ones up here. Not all of them, of course. Um, it would take up the entire screen with letters. We wouldn't be able to see it if I put every star name, but these are some of the brighter star names. Um, now, some of the stars, um, either they're too dim or... Uh, there's just really too many stars to give them all names. And so they have kind of catalog numbers. Um, and in terms of finding out the star names and what they are, there's a lot of different ways. Um, in my day, we use things like star charts and planispheres to be able to kind of identify and know what star the star names were. Today it's a lot easier. There's um, apps um, that you can download on your phone and you can just put your phone or your tablet or device up at the sky and it will tell you the name of the star that you're looking at. It'll tell you the constellation. It's really easy. Um, and so Savannah is also asking, what is the best way to learn and to find out about constellations? Really some of those apps like um, one that I know is called Starwalk, but there's a lot of different apps out there. Some are free, some are paid, um, and you can just point your phone up to the sky or your tablet, your device, and it will tell you what you're looking at. Um, you don't have to do it the old way of using a planisphere, which is kind of a circular piece of paper, and it had a dial, and you'd have to set the day and the season that you were outside looking at the stars. Um, now there's an app for that. And then when we're talking about the names of the constellations, you see Jim was asking about um, why did most stars have uh, Arabic names? And that's a really interesting um, question. And the reason is because um, for people of the Islamic faith, um, knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge is incredibly important. And there was a period of time, um, you know, in the... You know, early hundreds it was referred to as the uh, Islamic Golden Age and they studied the stars um, they also developed really um, complex mathematics um, algebra and things like that all have to come from um, Muslim people and um, also there were uh, Islamic astronomers and Many of the brightest stars are named after um, kind of Islamic traditions and Islamic names. So they have those Arabic names. Let's see, find and point out kind of some of the two that I like to talk about Altair and Deneb, right over here. So you have to stay up pretty late or wake up really early in the morning to see these stars. Right now in my planetarium, it's about 2.30 in the morning. Um, but Altair right here and Deneb, both are constellations that are birds. 
things. So, let's see. We have Altair as part of the constellation known as Aquila. And Neb right here. Cygnus, the swan. So these are some pretty constellations as well. Uh, now you can wake up really early in the morning or stay up really late at night uh, to, to see them now. Or if you wait a little bit later in the summer, you're actually going to be up higher in the sky um, kind of earlier. Again, as those constellations change. So those are some of the constellations and stars that have some of those Arabic names. But there are, I said there are 88 kind of Western constellations. But the cool thing is there are many other constellations from people of different cultures, and they've told their own stories here. So this is the Navajo constellations. And notice they don't use the entire sky. They only have certain constellations. Um, again, for what was important to their culture. Polynesians, who were um, seafaring people and traveled the Pacific Ocean and Fighting all of those islands throughout the largest ocean in the world. Um, and they use the, st the stars for wayfinding and navigation. And their constellations were what were important to them. And then we have our constellations, the 88 constellations in our sky. They told different stories. And so that's kind of the, the great thing about constellations in general is that um, the reason that we have them um, is really for, um, you know, whatever reason that we want. We can make up stories and, you know, for entertainment, to share culture, to share identity, to help us farm, um, help us understand the seasons, to map and study objects in the sky. Constellations can serve a whole variety of purposes. Now, um, I see Sarah was asking, what is my favorite time of the year for viewing constellations? And really, any, any night that I can get out and it's a clear night um, is a good night to, to look at constellations. But some of my favorite constellations, they come in the winter time. And if I'm going to jump in my time machine, I'm going to make it, let's say, January. Now, actually, we'll back it up. We'll go to December. There we go. Now, you might be able to actually see probably my favorite constellation right there in the sky. It's actually this group of stars right here. Um, this belongs to the constellation known as Orion. And we haven't talked much about Orion because Orion is a... We don't really see Orion in the spring and late spring and summertime. He uh, comes out in the, the fall and is really prominent in the winter uh, and sticks around until um, about March, early April. Um, and so we could see Orion in the sky right now. But Orion is probably one of my favorite constellations because there's so much going on with the constellation of Orion. Now, Orion is a hunter, but again, if I talk about using the constellation as a map, there are a lot of really interesting things within the constellation of Orion. One of them right here is just kind of Below Orion's belt, there's another group of three stars right here. Oops. And if I use my telescope to zoom in on Orion, you can see the Orion Nebula. Now, nebulas are uh, areas of gas and dust in space where stars are formed. 
and Orion's Nebula is one of the easier nebulas to observe because you can actually kind of see it with your own eye. It just looks like a star, but if you have a, a good pair of binoculars or a telescope, it'll start to look like a fuzzy cloud in the sky, kind of like that. And if you have a really high-powered fancy telescope, of course, like talking about Hubble-type telescopes, really big telescopes, uh, you can see a lot going on. And then also, here in the constellation of Orion, we have another nebula, just right up there, known as the Horsehead Nebula. And you can kind of see that horse head right there. And so just to, within this one constellation alone, there's a lot of really interesting objects in the sky to look at. So um, also, I'm a fan of nice cool nights. Um, if you have a nice clear night and it's cold, it's actually good for um, kind of telescopes. The atmosphere tends to be a little bit more stable and you can get better uh, images in the sky. So, the winter time is, is probably my favorite time to get out and look at the constellations in the sky. Well, everybody, that brings us just about to the end of our program. Thank you so much for um, tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the program. I hope you learned something new, maybe found something interesting. Um, and there are um, a lot of really um, excellent ways to continue to find out more about the night sky. We talked about a few of them. There are some apps that you can download on your device. Uh, many of them are free, and they can tell you about the stars. You can find constellations, and they make it really easy just to point it out um, and identify it in the sky. Um, of course, there are uh, other planetariums within your area in Portland and in Eugene. You can visit your local planetarium. Uh, of course, you also have your wonderful library, Wilhelmina Public Library, as well as your astronomy group, the South Yamhill River Astronomy Club. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to uh, show you the night sky, um, help you understand and learn about the space and the stars up above. So with that, I want to say farewell and have a wonderful rest of your day and i always like to wish everybody clear skies all right bye bye thanks for tuning in